when you are adding depth to any drawing, there's, there's a toolkit. And there's a bunch of ideas that you can kind of keep in the back of your head. You do not need to apply all of these in one drawing. But if your drawing looks flat, you can use this as sort of a checklist and sort of say like, what am I doing in this drawing that's kind of flattening it out? And can I tweak some of these things to give me more of a sense of depth in my picture? And so let's jump over to that chart. Here, here it is. Um, so um, we've got a, a bunch of, of different tools. And what I want to do is just sort of walk you through this. And then, so you kind of see them, I think it's helpful to sort of see them as a suite of strategies. And then we'll look at kind of how to apply those in a drawing. Um, and so obviously, if there are objects that are the sort of the same object, the smaller one, your brain is going to say that that one is further away from you. Um, because distant objects look smaller. But sometimes, you know, there's a smaller tree that's close to you, and there's a bigger tree that's further away, so that you, as you look at them, it looks like, oh, well, you know, that, that, that little tree out there is your brain is gonna to wanna to make that into a big tree. So in those sorts of situations, you can either choose to leave something out or you might use some of these other tools to still kind of um, help people make visual sense out of the space. This overlap is a gorgeous one that people don't use enough. The more you get sort of elements in your drawing overlapping each other, then it's clear that this one is on top of this one. And if, but very often we'll have a drawing where things just happen to be kind of side by side, just a little bit of overlap. Ah, that's all you need. Oh, and don't do this. Just tangent doesn't give you any real help. Make them kind of clearly overlap, and then your picture will make a lot more sense. Um, if you look at these little balls in this drawing, you can see that the one that is back here is higher in the picture plane. So the picture plane is this frame, and one is down here, the next one is up there. The higher you are in the picture frame, if you are perceived to be attached to the ground, that is, um, that is what is going to, in our brains, feel further back. As things get closer to the horizon, um, we, we see a circle as being more of a flattened disk. So the, in the sky, the more that clouds are further away from you, the base of those clouds will appear to be more flattened. So when you're looking out at a distant cloud, it looks like it's got a flat bottom and you're looking at the edge of it. If you look at one that is overhead, you're seeing the underside of the cloud. Similarly, if you're looking at trash can lids that are on the ground, the one that you're standing on is a perfect circle. The closer it is to the horizon, the more flattened it gets. This is a great strategy. If you put a frame in with your thing, just make your birdie break that frame. And then because this one breaks the frame, whatever breaks the frame is going to feel like it's in front. So that's a great way to kind of get a little bit of depth in a drawing. Um, I'm going to deal with this line one last. Um, detail goes in front, not in back. So this back mountain here, eh, yeah, no detail back there. If you put a bunch of detail on this back mountain, it will flatten out your picture. But very often, there's something cool back there. And so we want to draw it. Then just do a little inset off on the side instead of dropping a whole bunch of detail into that drawing. Generally, as we go from front to back, things are going to be getting darker 
as they go closer to us, um, lighter in value as they go back. And in addition to that, it's not just that things are getting darker, but actually in the foreground, that's where you're gonna see your lightest lights as well. So the contrast between your lightest lights and your darkest darks, between foreground, middle ground, and background is also going to change. In the background, no contrast between light and dark. Colors get more muted as you go into the background and colors actually shift more towards the blue end of the spectrum as you go towards the background because there's scattered blue light in the air, especially under human conditions, you'll find that. So this last one here, line, this has to sort of, is just a drawing trick that when you pop in a bold line, your brain goes, oh, thick telephone pole, that is closer to me. So thicker lines tend to feel like they are closer to the viewer than lighter lines. These other ones, there's something that we can actually see in the environment that is doing that. But in the, with the line work, it's actually just a drawing trick because there are no lines around real objects. So I find it is really helpful to have this as a list. And, and to remember, you can use you can use those. You don't have to use all of them, but um, so in the the journal that I made, um, so this is one of the blank journals that I created with a tone paper. In the back of it, there are some pages of resources. And one of those is this little summary chart. Let's take a look at it. It's um, a little bit blurry still. Oh, let's try this. Is that better? Still, still a little blurry. Uh, let's see. Um, I should uh, create a um, create something where I just have this little chart um, on something that you can um, print out onto an Avery label that people could print out and stick into their nature journals. I'll try to remember to do that um, because I, it just sort of you want these are all the reasons that things can look you know closer or or further to you. Let's take a look at this theory in practice. But again, remember, you don't have to do all of these on, on, every, um, on every drawing. But it's going to really help you to be able to, to think of this as, as, a, as a suite of tools for giving you depth. Have some fun classes. Let's see here. There we go. Um, let's just start with. Uh, we're going to make a couple of of, of landscapes. Um, some of them are going to have a really nice sense of depth. And then we'll, we'll use this list against us and sort of see how, if I'm not doing these things, it really kind of messes with our, our, our sense of space on those. There we go. So I'm going to do a little landscape drawing. And there is going to be a 
foreground of some point, there's, there's going to be some middle ground. Uh, and then there's going to be a little mountainy thing in the background. Um, so if I, I, I want to intentionally have things overlap. Um, so as I'm placing these little foreground and middle ground elements, I want those to be overlapping. And I have a mountain kind of coming in there. Um, I am not making any determination right now about where the top of my drawing is going to be. Right now, I'm just leaving that open. So later on, I'll sort of pick how high I want my sky to go. It's still, sorry, Jack. Um, it's still a little bit blurry and um, we can't see the lines very clearly. Oh, yeah. I'm actually drawing really pale here. Oh, okay. Um, so I could be doing this with the, the blue pencil, but this was, I just drew really pale lines in with my ballpoint pen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this is going to be a forested hill that is closer to me. And so I'm going to be putting more a little bit more detail in it. And there's going to be I'm going to just say there's going to be a little tree shape here. Um, I'm going to put in another little kind of tree shape in here. And another one back here. Um, I'm going to, in this area back here, just put in a, some cross hatching. And I'm going to put in a little bit more contrast. And all of that gives me sort of a sense of a middle distance kind of area of forest. I add in just a few little things that are kind of a little bit more detail, like here on this tree here. People see that, maybe this little bit here, and they go like, oh, this is forest, because I'm seeing these little detail parts here. I've also got contrast in here. Let's compare that with how this next forest is going to be handled. I'm going to give it a little bit of a jiggly line kind of coming up here. And I'm going to keep it more simple. I might put a little bit of contrast into it. And here what I'm doing is I'm making, very often I'll make these little downward shaped tornadoes like that. See how I'm making these little downward shaped tornadoes right there? And that often sort of makes it feel like there's, there's, there are trees on either side of those. But notice how this back zone here, the darks here are this dark and the lights here in the front are this light. And back here, the darks are this dark, and the lights are this light. And in the front here, I have some indication of little treetops. Yeah, it's not really 
as tree-ish back here. And lastly, there's going to be a little mountain form back here. As far as overlap goes, I have this piece in front of this piece in front of this piece. Maybe there's some form of, of a uh, river that is coming in here. And if I have a little bit of more detail and stuff in the foreground, I get the sense of a little drawing with depth. I'll put some sides on this. I don't want the midline to be here. I'm going to give this more. Yeah, there we go. There's a little bit more sky. But this can, so the things that I'm doing intentionally to get more depth here is I'm going to draw a little bird here. Eat. Right, so there's a few things that kind of are helping you get some sense of depth. I just broke the box here, right? So this, some of these grasses here on the close end of the stream, they kind of came out of the picture frame. That's kind of fun. Makes us feel like they're a little bit closer. Notice how heavy these lines are, compare them with these lines back here. Then I've got my woods, lovely, dark, and deep. In here, contrast, detail, less here and even less here. Now, um, also notice that this stuff here, right here, this is heavy line work. I'm going to drop down on this a little bit more. So heavy line work, heavy line work, lighter lines, light lines back there. Now watch what happens if I get carried away on my back mountain. There's some snow fields back there. And I said, oh, I want to include all those snow fields. And let's say I draw in its shape, but I give, I kind of really kind of get into this tree line, this, this ridge line here. And I punch that in with a heavier line. You see what it just did? That heavy line now feels like it is wanting to come forward. Did you see that happen? So it used to be a light line. Now it's a heavy line, and that's really flattening out my drawing. Similarly, I start putting in these snow fields. And need more contrast to get those snow fields to show up.
ah, it's the attack of the back mountain. Now look at how much closer that back mountain feels to you. What if I really get into the, ooh, there's pretty clouds in the sky. Oh, um, could you um, move? Oops, sorry. There we go. So now, rah, like these clouds are just jumping up. It's more visually confusing. And if I want to, um, but let's say at this point, I realize like, oh no, I put in that way too heavy. What do I do? Well, I'm gonna just go back to this bag of tricks and I'm now going to use that bag of tricks again to try to, 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 to mitigate some of those mistakes. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to take a mark pen. So this is the zebra pen that Mark Simmons loves. And I'm going to make some of these lines in here. I'm going to strengthen this. By putting that in... Um, that in with some darker lines, it popped this zone of forest out towards us a little bit more. I'm also going to put in some more you know, heavy lines in here. And I'm going to give this just a little bit more of the treatment so that it is now popping. It's, it can fight back against that attacking mountain a little bit. So what I did is, it used to be that my thickest line was this, but now my thickest line is that. I also can use color to play with the depth here. I'll remember that the blue wavelengths of light are going to scatter in the atmosphere. So if I have a blue wash on distant stuff, um, that pushes them back. Now, in this close forest, I'm going to have some greens. And there also are, I'm going to put in some little, kind of, little brown spots in here, some shrubs and vegetation in there. In that back one, I am going to make it more of a lighter uniform blue green. In my foreground out here, So very deliberate use of warm in the front, cooler in the back. Thank you. 
If, on the other hand, I had decided that, you know, there are some reddish volcanic rocks back there in the mountain, and I emphasize that, I'm going to get some red brown on my brush here. Watch what happens when I put warm color into that back mountain. Um, it's now wanting to come forward again. because of its color. Let's take a look at some real landscape sketches that I did. And we're going to see sort of where these tools and techniques are either working for me or not. All right, um, all right, so here is a back up more. Uh, so this is this big uh, landscape across Yosemite Valley um, going up uh, towards uh, on, on Mirror Lake. Um, so notice that. Um, let's, in this part of the drawing, that this line here, this one here, this one here, those are fairly equal weight, and that is flattening out that drawing a little bit in there. So notice that Mount Watkins here and the tree line and this back slope here, they're all getting heavier lines. Similarly, in this drawing here, everything is the same line weight. And that, that both of those sort of flatten those parts of those drawings out. This drawing here doesn't have a lot of depth. You get a little bit of sense of from overlap and more detail in the foreground that this is in front, that's in back. But that's the only real clue that you have to that. Um, in this one, something that is um, helping me is that even though my line weight is pretty solid throughout, I have this warmer in front, cooler in back, and less detail back there. So detail and color are all working for me there. Let's go to this little section up here. Notice that the stuff that's in front gets a heavier line here, this lighter line in the back, whoops, the lighter line in the background um, helps push that further back. Uh, These cliffs here, this is, a, notice this heavy line, and then you're jumping back onto half dome here, and especially as the lines come in and meet, these lines are getting lighter and lighter and lighter, and that really pushes this behind this. If I had a heavy line coming into here, it would feel that this isn't really in front, that these are all on the same plane. So having that be a nice bold line, and then especially in this part of half dome, going into light lines, that's helping push that back. 
right up here on Yosemite Falls. It's no accident that, let's zoom down on that a little bit more. Notice that these rocks back here have a lighter line. This one coming right in front of them here gets a heavier line, right? Especially right in there where they're kind of meeting. That says that this surface is in front and that one back there is further away. So what tricks am I using here to get a sense of depth? These trees in front, it's sort of more bold and busy. And here, that busyness, sort of read that as, as more detail. Even if I'm not drawing individual branches, because there's just sort of more pen marks in there, that busyness detail pulls that forward. These parts in the front, look at this really high contrast. Really dark darks next to really light lights. Detail here in the foliage, leaves, bushes, branches, even some gouache coming in on top to make these little pale marks in there. And let's see here. Here, you can see me using lighter line weight back here. I mean, heavier line weight in this slope here. So this slope gets a heavier line weight. This one back here, medium, and this back here, really light. Things that are closer to me get more detail. The further you go away, the less you get. Also, look at the contrast in the slope here. This slope here gets two values, this medium dark and the light. All this back stuff, just light. Now you're seeing heavy line weight, detail of trees, stuff in the back, lighter. Contrast. So I'm using that same bag of tricks again and again and again. Over here, contrast helps pop these surfaces up towards you. We have a, a question about about the grays that you use. Are you creating it using watercolors or the Tombow gray brush pens? Um, I started with Tombow on this, and then my Tombow during this trip gave up the ghost. And I also found that I, because I only had one Tombow with me that was dying, it wasn't able to push the, the value. But originally, I was doing these uh, with a Tombow brush pen. Um, so this, this here was Tombow brush pen, but I couldn't, as, as it was just kind of running out of juice, um, I, uh, I wasn't able to kind of go further with it. So I gave up my, my Tombow. Um, here's kind of an interesting little study here. Look at how much blue is in Half Dome there.
that really pushes it back. This, when I was doing this, this felt very flat until I really pushed the blue in there. And it was fun. Um, later on that day, I came back at a different time of day and there was evening light lighting up the face of Half Dome. And so I got that. That's breaking the rule. <laughs> Um, so let me show you a way if it's sort of feeling like, oh my gosh, there's too much to, to handle here in, in, in doing this. Let's say, um, I want to do a little Yosemite landscape. Hold on a second. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just blocking this in with my um, blue pencil. I have an El Capitan and a hill coming down. So I'm really thinking kind of getting my overlap in here and then that's going to overlap another slope that comes up like this. There's going to be another slope that comes down and it's going to overlap that. So I'm going to really have a lot of overlap, overlap, overlap. I see all that overlap. I'm saying to myself, oh, I can get a lot of depth in there. Um, now, um, half dome is going to be occupying sort of this area in here. And so I've got I've got a lot of a lot of overlap. What I'll sometimes do is block in these sorts of sketches, and then once I've got it, what I used to do is I draw in my frame and then draw my landscape within that. Now what I often do is kind of just get some of these little overlapping major structure lines, and then figure out within that. I think I'm going to make my frame just like that. So I'm putting in the frame after I figured out where all my overlapping elements are. Overlap, check. Now, let's go for detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw this whole thing. If it's, again, I'm, I'm kind of, we're going to address the, it feels like it's too much to keep all these little pieces in mind, right? But let's just take the next thing. Um, let's take detail here. So I'm going to draw this little sort of tree line. I'm making a, a little squiggle here that's like a bad EKG. In a few places I'll put in a dead tree sticking up. Or happy little trees. All right. So if that's my, um, um, my, my, my happy trees in the foreground, then my next level of, let's say this is this, that on this uh, hillside here, there's some trees on this. All right, I'm going to just sort of make that a little kind of lighter line, a little bit of a jiggle. And so now I've got a detailed difference here. This one here gets like this major kind of EKG action with even some kind of trees drawn into it. This one here just gets a little jiggle. And this one back here, might just be a line. 
So you see in the detail of these lines, more, less, and even less. Now let's throw in um, uh, El Capitan here. And because it's cool, it's tempting to really press hard, but I'm not doing that. And similarly on Half Dome here, I'm not, it's, the, again, it's really tempting to, to put in a, a very bold line on anything that is super cool. Which that little part of the line there was not as bold. See how that bold part of that line there wants to pop forward? Ah. So speaking of that, let's just put in a little bit more deliberate line variation. What if this line here that's in front? So now it's, it's mostly this is with the same sort of line weight. Um, but what if I kind of come in here and I'm going to pop this line? And I'm going to strengthen this line along here. So what I'm doing is I'm coming in after the fact and strengthening some of those lines. So especially right, right, right here where this one crosses, I'm gonna strengthen that line a little bit, but not too much. So I didn't have to do all that stuff at once. I first blocked in my overlap. I then put in lines with more detail. And then I came in and by popping some of those lines, I got a lot more depth in there. I'm now gonna just put some more pen on top of this and we'll look at this just as a ballpoint pen drawing. And then we'll take a look at it again if I want to add some color to it. So with, with, uh, with this, um, I'm going to just, uh, rather than like draw a bunch of trees in here, I'm going to put in a bunch of kind of hatching marks that go in different directions. And this, because this then is a little bit more busy, that also is going to pull this part forward. So I'm making these little sort of sets of overlapping lines kind of going in different directions, getting this to be a darker value. Not just a darker value, it's kind of busy. And then compare that with That is not as busy. And this is even less busy.
I wish that this line here were not as bold. That really kind of pulls this zone into the foreground a little bit. Don't really like that, but you know, it's there and it's pen, so it's okay. Because what I it's often useful to kind of notice what if you did, were to do this again, it, would you make any decision that was different? And in that, this case, that's that's what that would be for me. But yeah, this 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 little hatching in here does you know this is just all this is just this is kind of representing that. Yeah, if things are more busy, they do feel closer. Even without looking like trees. But it's also weird to see the degree to which when we see that there are trees in the background, we often will then kind of turn whatever random, I mean, that there's sort of a tree edge on it we then will turn whatever is kind of going on here into like, oh yeah, those are trees. There's really nothing about, if you just looked at this bottom part, there's nothing about that would say that these are trees. But the minute you get that little tree line building, like, oh, like, there's a little forest over there. What do you think? Um, let me, um, just use the Tombow on this and we'll see what we get. I've just got one color of Tombow here. And now I'm going to go over these parts a second time, make that darker. So that's neat with Tombow is you can hit it a couple of times and you get darker. Lastly, if I want, I could leave it like this. As, I could have left it as a ballpoint pen, could have left it as a Tombow. Um, if I did do it as a watercolor, I probably wouldn't have to do that Tombow step in there. So you don't have to do Tombow and then, um, and by when I'm saying Tombow, what I'm talking about is the Tombow brush pen. So these are cool pens that have a brush tip on one side and they have a little marker end on the other. And they're, they're a cool little uh, brushes. But let's, uh, I will make that sky rather dull having that gray in it. But let's, let's just sort of for giggles, just sort of see what happens if I get Oops, sorry for drifting off the screen there. Now, 
Oh yeah, well, let's let's make these things really drop back. I want them to be darker than the sky. So it helps to have the cloud there breaking those. I'm going to leave this little surface here catching some sunlight. So we're getting we're darker towards the foreground. Here we're just I'm just using blue. And as you get closer to me, we're going to get more color coming out. And Uh, you can't really see it here, but I've got a more vivid green going on in here. It doesn't really show up on the page. I'm putting a little bit of brown into it, but it all looks black on there. Huh. It's all right. Lastly, I think I might want my sky, particularly in this place right in here, to be a little bit of a lighter value. Sky, as you go closer towards the horizon, gets more pale. So I'm going to just take a little bit of gouache and put it in here. Gouache is an opaque paint. There you go. So these are just playing with a few of those depth tricks. And uh, I hope that that was useful. Let me. As you're messing around with these sorts of things, I want to encourage people to just try to make a bunch of smaller landscapes. You can play with these ideas. And in a small landscape, if you don't like the way it turned out, you can just do another one. And that one took you a few minutes. That's one reason why landscape ethos, they're, they're really forgiving because you know they're small, take two. Um, and the also, if you have spent a lot of time kind of investing in a big landscape thing and you don't like part of it, um, sometimes that can be discouraging to people if we're really focusing on, on I want to make a pretty picture of this landscape. Sometimes we want to make pretty pictures. Again, I know pretty pictures are not important, but sometimes you want to do that. And that's okay. You're not a bad person for wanting to try to make a pretty picture over there. Um, but if you didn't like it, um, so two suggestions. Suggestion number one is to do another because they're small. The other thing that if you don't like a little landscape that sketch that you get as an, as an art piece, just say to yourself, it is no longer a, um, a painting, it's a diagram. And holding something in your head as a diagram is really, really powerful. Really, really powerful. Let me just, I'm gonna jump back to this thing one last time and I'm gonna turn that sketch that I just did into a diagram.
And you, what you'll see is that I'm going to just start adding written notes and little lines and things. And the amount of data of information that is contained in that section of my page goes way up. And very often, um, you know, our, our brains are attracted to things that are really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of information in there. And if you kind of move away from, I have to make it be a pretty thing and actually have it be more of a data dense thing, very often like that's really interesting. And you kind of like, oh, that's really, really cool. And it takes all the pressure off this drawing to have done all the weight. So let me just turn this into a diagram. We'll see how that looks. Wanna encourage you to do the same. Um, so here it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, this is El Capitan. So I'm making a little note about what, what's going on with the weather. What are some of the peaks? Um, so I've just added in a few little written notes. Um, and then what happens is the information is partly held by the, uh, by, the, by the picture, but also our attention goes out to these things and it just, it becomes more of a, a data dense conversation about whatever's going on. So I really love adding in little written notes with, with this, let, let's take a look in my, in this sketch here. You'll see me doing this all over the place. All right, so here it's mostly labels. Right, I was interested in what's what, who's who out here. Um, but sometimes, right, you know, um, so right, right here, um, the falls pop out from the valley wall, right? A cone of granite that sticks out into the valley, leaning. Right. Um, so ribbon falls, thin, long, deep. Uh, you no, know, adding those, uh, you know, little notes in here that um, the rock is stained black. Um, what what causes the dark around the fall? So it's not just wet rocks. Um, water in free fall, about six seconds to bottom. Roar of Merced River, song sparrow singing. So you start to annotate these sketches and it can hold so, so, so much more information. And um, consider that as like over here, right? So here's the incense cedar. These are ponderosa pines down here. And that is the power of annotating all over those landscape notes. I hope that this was useful. Um, pencil miles are really important. If what you're doing connects you with the place and is fun, you're doing it right. These strategies, you don't have to use them all. 
Um, that's why I like to have it as kind of a little cheat sheet. If things feel flat, I'll kind of go like, oh yeah, that whole putting blue in the back. Yeah, and then there are some times where blue's not in the back. And then you go like, Ooh, okay, blue's not in the back. That's interesting. What else can I use to kind of counteract that tendency for that blue um, to feel really back? And here I'm not seeing blue in the back. So when I really look at this landscape, I'm not seeing that. So I'm not gonna put that in. But ooh, I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna work with my line variation or one of these other strategies. How can I get overlap to work in there a little bit better? Play with it. I think you're going to have some fun and happy journaling, everybody. Let's jump over to our community cam and um, see what's been happening with our nature journal community here. Um, the uh, it's great to catch up with you all. Um, and I'm going to jump over to my gallery view. And uh, the way this works, if you're if you're new to this, um, people are holding up their journals and we'll spotlight them and we'll see what is happening on those journal pages. And um, I'm going to now I've allowed you to be able to unmute yourself. So I'm going to ask people to kind of keep yourself muted unless you are spotlighted. And then we'll bounce around to different folks and see what is up with you. Um, so I'm going to first, um, um, Ayoka, it's really good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us here. Hi there. Hello. Hello. It's finally becoming really springy here. So I've been in the woods and I've been journaling the beech um, tree. <gasps> coming out so i found one that wasn't sprouted and then i found one where the little sprout has broken off and then i i was just fascinated how they pop out out of their shell and they still retain that triangular shape and then they they open the first leaves and then today i drew the one like they and different stages all over the forest and then that's the actual leaves coming in the middle there oh wow Wow, wow, wow. So yeah, so these are the cotyledons that are first popping up and then the leaves are, are jumping out in the middle of that? Yes. That's yeah. really cool. And I was comparing them to acorns. So I'm still in the process of doing more acorns. I did those today. Um, oh, this is such an interesting, what an exciting moment in nature, isn't it? Yeah. And so, so just to get, be clear, you went out and you weren't drawing one over time, but you found a bunch of different ones in different states and you lined they're them up. All, they're all there. These, all these are there at this moment. I didn't draw them all the same day, but they're all there at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, also the acorns are in different conditions, but they're more similar than those ones. Those, those pop up. And uh. I was comparing how the, how they, in the fall, they're both kind of like a nut inside. So yep. an acorn is kind of nutty and, and the beech nut is kind of nutty. But as the beech nuts come out, the, the whole nut transforms into the leaves. Whereas with the acorns, which I haven't really drawn yet, the acorns stay acorns and the sprouts come out and they, they uh, probably there's like, they, they are the, the tank for the energy for the growth, but it's different for the beech nuts. They become, they transform like a caterpillar. <laughs> oh, oh, great. It reminds me of. Um, so there's two strategies here that um, Ioka is doing. And, and tell me, what forest are you looking in? Uh, wh where are you based? In Germany. In Germany. Um, so in as she's going through the forest, she's using two different strategies that I want to, well, lots of different strategies, but two that I want to point out here. Um, one is that um, she is, is doing this, um, she's found a topic so you can find you know, one of these things that's po poking up, then you try to find one that's a little bit younger and a little bit younger than that, a little bit younger than that. And you can go back in time and you can go forward in time, one that's a little bit older than that, one that's a little bit more developed than that, what happens next? And so you don't have to sit there with one and watch it over time, which is another cool project to do. Um, you can get that whole timeline just in one place. 
right? So there's some people out there going like, ooh, I think I want to try that. What a celebration of springtime. And then also notice that she's got a comparison going on. She's got the beech versus the acorn. And by having these together, um, it makes the contrast between them and these two totally different strategies so much more vivid and interesting. Like how interesting that in one, the, the nut, that outer part falls off and then that's the leaves. And in the other one, the nut is the storage, the lunchbox for sending up all this other stuff. That's cool. That's cool. So she's doing comparison and she's also doing a, um, a, a timeline. Right. Um, when you see other people doing cool ideas in their nature journal, sometimes you can just in the back of your journal, like write down some little notes of like something that you can do when you go out and play. All right? Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, let's, I'm going to jump back to my gallery view and see what else uh, people are up to hold something up to the screen. And I see um, Tracy has got something here to show us. Tracy, good to see you. Oh, wait, wait you're currently muted. Um, Sorry. There we go. Um, so it was the, the pink moon last night and I didn't, I knew I didn't really have the time to be out there or like it starts to get chilly yet. So they kind of look like floating turds, but I just tried to grab ideas of what I was seeing so that I could visit it later. So yes. um, we had a cloudy night and, but I, like I knew immediately when I saw it, like, okay, this is my first pass. I want to just capture, like I wrote, there were colors in, in rings and rays as they illuminated behind these clouds. And, um, yeah, it was more like making notes. I also got like a little poetry pop in my head. And um, yeah, so this was more like not the pretty picture yet, but like, like I'm so excited to be like, okay, I'm gonna look at other things and how do these lights come behind these clouds and how do they look like clouds, which are normally white in your mind, but dark in this image. And um, so it's like a whole little, place to jump into and and dive into um uh, tracy that's that that's such a I, I i love your um that's a very refreshing approach and that allows you to get so much more out of 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 being there not stressing out about i gotta make you know, like here's this complicated subject but just like all right there's going to be a lot more notes and what you but you, what you were doing is you were paying attention to the phenomenon you were connecting with nature through the pages of the nature journal. And that sometimes comes out with some sketches. Sometimes that comes out with written notes. And here it's also come out with some poetry. Do you feel comfortable sharing the, 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 the poetry? Or sometimes little, yeah, poetry comes out as just like part of a phrase that, that feels right. Right. Um, pink lady clouded, rare blush glory shrouded. Yes. And I, I'm also like in my mind, I'm thinking of this rose that is like yellow, but tinged pink. I don't know what it's kind of rose that's called, but like that was like happening around the edges of the clouds. And like, so there's more words, there's probably more images. It's probably not gonna be just like, here's a, like it'll be a, a, a part that's realistic to what I saw, but also presenting these images that come from what I saw as well, kind of mixed in. So I don't know, this thing's got um, a lot of legs and I don't know where it's going yet. That's, that's, that's so cool. And because you are connecting with an absolutely wonderful phenomenon. And also kind of notice um, how, so uh, Tracy, you did something that was really brave here and I want to spotlight that. And that is that you had a work in progress, not pretty picture thing where it's just, and, it uh, where you were excited about something and you sh shared that um that is that is the nature journaling spirit that may we all have 
Yeah. Um, and how, how did that, um, what advice do you have for people to kind of let people kind of just loosen up and you're like, some people just kind of go like, oh, I don't know where I'd even start with those clouds up there with the moon and they're all kind of moving around. So I'm not going to do it. What do you, advice might you have to people to kind of just get people to dive in? All right, for us adults, we probably don't think of tree climbing all that much right now, but when you are tree climbing, probably also rock climbing, but you like, you work one branch. You're like, I'm gonna get up here. Like I've seen my kids like climbing trees and they don't think like, how am I gonna get like super high where I wanna be? They just think, I wanna go up. What's this branch? What's that? And they're like knowing that maybe there's a far away goal, but there's just right here and just moving right here, one little step at a time. And, you know, knowing that it isn't the end in the beginning, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. we're just, you know, we're getting our feet wet and then eventually we'll be swimming in the pool. And that, you know, honestly, I've had um, a lupus flare up and I've really been back to square one. And that's the strategy that I take to keep going every day and now I have art to apply it to as well. And it's like a, I don't know, a refraction of a lot of cool ideas that keep me moving forward. So like the lupus stuff, it taught me that it was okay to do this because like with lupus, sometimes, you know, making it to the breakfast table is your goal. Um, and yeah, I just applied that here. Like, I don't know, good ideas ping pong all over and help things so in your life. You know, that is, you're embracing that vulnerability and being willing to stand where you are. And that's incredibly powerful. I mean, all the, so many of the Buddhist texts are trying to get us to do exactly that, to be, you know, here and now, um, <clears throat> instead of, there and some other time right and we're only really here now yeah yeah and i'm so sorry to hear about the the lupus that sounds awful and that you can turn that into inspiration for yourself and this community thank you so much thank you so deep respect <laughs> um I'm going to jump over to the gallery and see what's up. Hey, Ray Bonto, good to see you. Um, I am going to bring on our friend Ray Bonto. Good to see you again. Hi. So, I'm a fan of pencil nowadays for some reason. Uh, I stopped using pen, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so, now, it, this turned out to be a bit darker because instead of getting N N95, I got N75, which is a bit darker. Uh, uh, but it was oh, yeah, but I really get a sense of depth in that picture. It, there's, look, I mean, everybody check that out. There's depth and atmosphere in that little sketch that Ray Bonto has, has created there. Yes. Uh, here, I decided to use 12B instead of a zebra pen because mine has run out. Um, mm -hmm. So. Oh, yeah. And, and again, you've got that, that depth. But the, the, the 12B, is that giving you really nice dark values when you want them? Yeah. It's so soft, in fact, that you can add it over a wet watercolor without doing anything to the paper. Oh, that's really cool. Um, I, I would like a Tombow, another lesson because like mine looks too markery. What am I doing wrong? Okay. It doesn't look watercolory. It looks marker. Um, we, we should have a, a, a we'll, we'll, we'll try to do a, a, a Tombow, I'll, I'll try to set up a, a Thursday Tombow play workshop. Okay. And then, um, I forgot if you've seen this drawing, Jack, but I, but a few days ago, I just filled up. 
Oh, I haven't um, seen this. Oh boy. Oh, this is so exciting. These observations. Tell me about your experience doing this and what you noticed. In flight, yes, like that. Yes. They're quite easy, in fact, for me. Um, so that, and that. Mm -hmm. Oh, these flight studies are really exciting. Um, and are these from um, from watching live animals in the field? Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha! That's the way we roll, Ray Bonto. This is really exciting to see. And everybody, doesn't it look like it is fun to put that white uh, paint on your page too? That's one of the joys of, uh, and Valters will back me up on this, um, of that toned paper. So much fun. But um, I'm also really seeing your understanding of um, wing structure and the foreshortening. Now, this is really exciting to see. Yeah, so um, total paper has in fact made it much easier because when I want to draw a squirrel, I don't have to color it brown and gray. All I have to do is color it gray with a pencil, color the uh, uh, tummy with a white, and leave the head plain. Mm -hmm. You don't need watercolor. So, yep. yeah. Uh, I need to maintain layout a bit, but that doesn't matter. Um, so. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, and I want to bring, um, Avea had uh, some uh, comments on, on that. Do you want to, to share those, Avea? Just that I love, I love the variety on your page um, with the pigeons, the way that you have the different line drawings and that some are colored in. And I'm and, and this time I'm noticing that there are like different sizes in your drawings too. And 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 then th just the way that you capture all of the different postures, you know, some just because like I can just tell that you're totally following their movements and 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 whether you're drawing like as they're as they're flying or for memory, just you capture so much variety in your page and so much of the life of the pigeons. Um, and and I can just tell all of your pencil miles are paying off because you, you go back and you sketch them and you follow them. And so now you're able to capture them like just in so many different poses and it, it's magical to see that, Ray Bonto. And I'd really, really like for you to meet up with Mark Simmons so you both can draw pigeons because that was something he wants to do too. So, so it's really fun to see your page. It, it, I absolutely agree. And and yes, you know, you're over this pandemic. You have done so many pencil miles, and we can see it. Just it, uh, and the results are stark and clear. Um, your ability to see and to render. Um, so as an artist and as a naturalist observer, um, so strong. We're really proud of you. Um, and then um, um, here, this was incomplete because I had to rush for email class and I just managed to get out and sketch this. Yeah. Uh, so, but I went to Carshalton Park, uh, which is uh, another park nearby, with a, which has got a river and hundreds of cool stuff, the bird stocks. So. Oh. oh, look at these forms. Yes. Really exciting. Just you know, different um, angles and bodies and moments. Um, everybody noticed that sometimes drawing larger, sometimes drawing smaller. Um, intentionally cross training your brain like that, getting um, things from 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 details to sometimes just the silhouette shape. Really great way to train your brain. Uh, this I think was a female mallard. These two. Mm -hmm. uh, then, um, here, uh, I saw a female mallard, and I decided to do a portrait of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, with, with all of those subtle um, browns, so many people just focus on the males and ignore um, the, the females. Females just do uh, 
just incredible subtlety and beauty. And if you can find, train yourself to find the, the, the beauty in that, there's a whole wonderful world that is open to you. And um, also as, as scientists, um, you know, if we are just focusing on what do the males do, we're missing, oh, half of the bird population um, <laughs> is doing you know, the critical work. Um, so I'm really delighted to see you uh, focusing on those, uh, the forms of those females. Uh, and I also saw that coots were nesting <gasps> and I saw a baby. Oh, you found a baby coot. Oh, aren't they crazy looking things? Yeah, so they look like a, a fuzzed up small moorhen. Yeah, well, they're absolutely nuts. Um, and the, and coots do, you know, uh, uh, th there's some really interesting research on, on coot chick um, because they've got these, uh, th these crazy colors and, and, and feathers going out on them. Oh, this is exciting. This is a tufted duck. Um, and um, I went back to the heron nest um, and I saw the female female's head peek out. And I did catch a glimpse of the small heron. And it was black. And, and then some herons came and I went nuts with them. <gasps> oh. Hey, my friend, this is next level stuff. This is next level stuff. This is, you have, you've, you've, uh, you know, our, our, in our progression, it's, uh, there are places where we kind of take a big jump. This is, this is so exciting. I mean, just, I'm noticing the, you know, the subtle blends of colors in the, the beak of that heron. Um, also, how you're handling um, the gouache, um, the so your um, understanding of your understanding of how to use the medium and the details that you are training yourself to focus on and see. This is this is really exciting. And so. I, this was a gray heron, not a gray blue heron mm -hmm. uh, that I saw. And this was back to gray blue heron. Um, uh, yeah, I did. And also, on. and I noticed that on, on that uh, heron on the right page there, um, uh, Ray Bonto chose to just darken the value behind it to get that white to pop out even more. So you really just get a sense of the brilliance of that. And don't you love that little kind of uh, tuft of white that sometimes blows up um, right on the forehead of the heron? Um, yeah, I've never seen that. Uh, it looked like, uh, well, uh, this heron was standing about a meter away from uh, me. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and, um, so then we switched parks. The next day I went here, I, I did catch a glimpse of a heron and then it flew away. Uh, <laughs> this was an Egyptian goose. And then the Egyptian goose went to sleep and I caught a few illustrations of them. You, so you're just you're just flowing with whatever nature gives you, and you're going deep. Whatever yeah. nature gives you, you're you're getting that, and the next thing, and, and the there are some subtle shadows in here. Those blues and those 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 shadows there. That is really so much depth. I saw a baby Egyptian goose, and this is the baby you also went to sleep with. Mm -hmm. uh, this one. And this was standing up. I just quickly got this down. And when I came home, I did this in colored pencil. And for some reason, it didn't smudge onto the. Uh, 
Canada Goose and uh, this is a Canada Goose. Oh, this is exciting. Um, so if, if you don't mind me asking a personal question, how old are you right now? I am about uh, 10, and this year I'll turn 11. 10 going on 11. Um, the, uh, I, I think it would be interesting for, at some point I'm gonna to try to uh, find one of my sketchbooks from when um, I was 10 years old and um, you have already put in so many pencil miles and your approach and attitude and inquiry is so developed. Um, I think that you will be, um, uh, you know, uh, we're, your, 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 your progress is just so exciting to watch here. <gasps> oh, <laughs> can hide the wagtail from me. Oh, you dog. <laughs> uh, this was a, another kind of goose and I caught a glimpse of another heron, which was sitting. I, I like that kind of, that hunch of the heron, the hunch of the heronness. It's so cool. Hey, I never knew wagtails live here except the pied wagtail. Uh, but along the river, suddenly out of nowhere, I saw a gray wagtail hopping about. Oh, isn't that exciting? And then you're you've you spent so much time observing that you're you're ready to document all of these details. What an interesting pattern on that wing it has. That must have been so much fun with those dark, um, those 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 really dark value patches, and um, and the and the, the the bright white on it. Uh, that's really fun to see. Thank you. And Jack, um, I just had a quick quick question, um, a bit, you know, silly, but uh, you sent me your sock. Uh, and I never found a better sock for cleaning and I lost that. So what's the brand of your sock exactly? <laughs> the brand of the sock. Um, I, um, I, I usually go for it just of, for cotton socks. Um, and yeah, right now I'm, I'm just sort of like whatever cotton sock is, is, is handy. I like to, I used to like to have like a dark sock because then you couldn't see that it was kind of getting all this paint on it. But now I really like the uh, to have an old white sock. So the, 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 for some reason, like when I do laundry, I'm always losing a sock. And so I get these, these socks that just don't have a match. And if it's cotton, I'll then cut off the toe, stick that on. And, um, but, 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 but cotton is gonna be much better than um, synthetic. Um, and, but I like to have the white ones because when you, then you can tell when your brush is clean, right? Like, oh, there's no more color coming out on it. Yay. All right. But there will be another sock. Uh, thank you. It is, it, I mean, so exciting to see what you've been doing with that. Um, and, um, I, uh, recommend that you take a look through the, um, through the chat. Um, you're going to see that there's a lot of support for you in this community. We are really exciting to, excited to see. Um, we're really, really excited to to see your the the results of your pencil miles. Thank you so much for sharing. Do you know that. we're down here. Thank you. Uh, and you don't need to worry about my spotting scope. Uh, I found one, and it's coming soon. Excellent. Um, did you, so yeah, Vol, Vol just had some really good suggestions on that. So I'm happy to hear that and uh, delighted that uh, you're going to have a, a, oh, I, <laughs> when, when you get your hands on that thing, there's going to be another just explosion of uh, Rebanto creativity coming our way. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. You know, one really funny thing is that when you've got a straight one, um, the one uh, we're going to get is has got a straight eyepiece, uh, one that goes up and for a prism, yeah. And then uh, uh, when you, if you want to look at the moon, uh, when you, if you have an angled one, you have to lie it down and that eyepiece is flat on the ground. Uh, uh, but here, you, it just points uh, down 
and you can just lie down and watch the moon with the red light. <laughs> oh, that's that's going to be so much fun. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump back to the gallery here. Um, Ivea, it's really good to see you. Um, let's see what's happening in your journal. OK, so first, my little story behind this. I was at my restoration site on Friday, pulling up the bird journal, and I had all of these fancy plans. You know, I was going to draw the entire thing, even though it's covered in multipinately compound leaves. I was going to draw a comparison between that and the poison hemlock since they were growing side by side. You know, going to draw the environment before and after where all of the bird journal, and then I had all of these lofty, lofty plans. And then this is all I, I managed to draw. <laughs> Not as much as I had planned. <laughs> yep, yep. And you know what? I show this page because sometimes that's just how it goes. Um, I, my hands were needed. I, I, I love nature journaling, but I needed to use my hands to pull up all of the bird shrivel. I managed to get rid of about maybe 80% of it. And part of why I needed to is because it was beginning to set seeds. Mm. Um, the flowers were transitioning from being flowers to being seeds. And so I needed to prioritize getting as much of it up as I possibly could. But instead of getting discouraged because I couldn't draw all of that, I just drew what I could. And I guess that's why I'm sharing this is to remind people that if you can't get everything, that's okay, just do what you can. Um, I got the metadata, I wrote down what happened that day so I can remember it later. Um, we can see if there'll be less bird shrivel sprouting up next year because we got it before it set seeds. Or maybe in the future we can examine the seed bank and have fun with that and I can do a Y web on that, you know? It'll yeah, be, it'll be yeah. a rabbit hole to fall down. Um, and I got to draw I didn't draw an entire leaf, I drew even just a little bit. And then I decided I didn't want to drive myself crazy, so I stopped right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay, because now I, I have a good memory of what it was like. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So it's, this is Burr Chervil. Yep, Burr Chervil. Oh, sorry. I, I thought you were saying uh, bird gerbil, and I was going, I've never heard of a bird gerbil. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and then I, this was from like the time before. Um, and that was more like with the landscape. Um, th that's like I've, I'd put a little bit of the green in here because I was trying to distinguish it from the background. Yeah. So when you were talking today about that, I was thinking that was very much what I've been trying to do is work like with the darks and the lights and everything like that. Yeah. And that's where one uh, of those. A little sketch has, let's go back to that little uh, sketch there. So notice how um, we, uh, we've, we've got uh, lights in there. So there's, we, we see the light sparkling on these. Um, and also punching in those darks makes those lights, those adjacent lights really glow and pop. Um, so the lights feel light because the darks are dark. And um, that gives this just, you know, so much um, sparkle. Thank you. And another thing that can be kind of fun is if you're diagramming and you're somebody like me who just really likes pens too much, you can write down your notes in different colors and then they stand out. So when you're pointing at <laughs> things, you write them in this. And then when you're writing just your narrative, then you write it in this color and it makes oh, it fun. easier later on when you're trying to read your stuff. So just some extra. Yeah, that's that's great. And and and, and also on, on this, you know, it's it's about connecting with the world. It's not about the way a page should look. The page that you get is the page that you get. And um, so just being present with that, that's really, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, let me see here. I'm gonna jump over to my gallery view. And um, Nicholas, I think uh, Nicholas, at the end of this call, we get to have a, a, a special little talk. Um, um, looking forward to planning um, a, uh, a, a deep dive with you on your research for one of our, our programs. Let me spotlight you and we'd love to see what's happening in your journal. Hi everyone. I wanted to share this with you. I hope it's it's sharp for you. Yes, it's, yes, uh, yes. Oh, so the Harrier. Very lucky from our uh, dinner table. We can see him going around and trying to get any voles that are living uh, in the bushes and the hills. So uh, we try to capture it in terms of uh, as many sites as possible. And then it's always coming when we are actually taking our, our time and then the, in the dinner so room. So it's, it's very funny. 
and he's always trying to get something. So, uh, <laughs> and every time he's, he's missing, uh, we never saw actually him being successful. So a lot of effort getting something but I do hope he will get something. Uh, we see a lot of traces of uh, activities from the winter uh, for the ball. So the snow it has, uh, has receded and, uh, and we could see all the, the nests from the winter from the, the different balls. So uh, it's, it's promising. So maybe they will nest close by and then we'll enjoy their, their little activities more. Yeah. So yeah. that's... Uh, that's that. Uh, I tried to do a little landscapito, uh, trying to get this kind of contrast, but I, I think I, I will need to to do some some more work on that. But 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 that 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 really sort of shows you that kind of low flight that the harriers take in, and um, that bit of context uh, is really helpful in understanding the, the the critter in the moment. Also, your understanding of wing shapes in flight here is really uh really exciting to see these you. there was this uh impression in fact when you don't look with the binoculars you have the impression that the the bird is much smaller because uh one is in in, in terms of a dark contrast you see really just uh, the first part of the wing and then it looks like a very tiny bird uh, except when he's able to go above the horizon and, and then you can see really the, the dark coming out. So I, I noticed that when you really don't, are not able to see that, I can understand why some people can miss this beautiful bird in, in the area without any binoculars because of the, that type of uh, contrast. Mm -hmm. And then I see also when I work on this uh, tinted paper, I, I need to... to get myself some gouache because I just have some watercolor and then the, the white are, I need to put a lot of layers to get something out, but yeah. uh, I think I need even more. That's fun. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, the, the gouache on toned paper, you're gonna, once you get that in your hands, you're like, oh, ha, this is my, this was my missing piece. That's really fun. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, love seeing those different views those different angles and directions, and also hold it up one more time, if you would. Um, mm -hmm. Notice that there's different sizes. Um, when you intentionally shake all that up, um, it's it's really freeing. And then, you know, it perches cooperatively. Okay, now I get a zoom in on the head. Then, yeah. um, but there's, for um, a lot of us, you know, we'd be doing the thing where we're zooming in on the head, then it starts flying around and then be like, people would say like, well, I'm gonna wait till it perches again so I can continue that drawing. But you're just going with whatever nature gives you, you go with that. That's great, thank you. I tried thank to you. put the, the movement uh, in there uh, for the, the birds. So when he's flapping and then try to be uh, immobile while yep. flying. Yeah, so that's the, the try there. Ah, love it, thank you. Thank you.